Welcome to this tutorial, which is boldly entitled Electromagnetic Scattering in Earth Remote Sensing, the Machine Code Approach. I will soon explain the meaning of it. My name is José Luis Álvarez Pérez and I work for the University of Alcalá in Spain. My contact details are given on this page and I will always welcome anyone contacting me on the subject of electromagnetic scattering from random media. The outline of this tutorial is as follows. We will start with a quick introduction and will try to define the objectives that we intend to reach. Our starting point will be Maxwell's equations and from them we will come to the wave equation. The role of the scalar and vector potentials are, uh, are going to be described uh, because they are fundamental tools in many of the relevant formalisms that we will go through. They are also important in the context of computational electromagnetics, which is uh, a subject we will not deal with in this tutorial, even though we will learn the basic language to handle it. Other concepts of foremost importance are the idea of coherence and polarization, which are often used in a non-rigorous manner, but which admit a precise mathematical and physical definition. We will also speak about Green's functions, especially about, about its application to electromagnetic scattering, in particular inside the integral equations for the electric and magnetic fields. We will also comment uh, on what I call here the algebra of scattering, that is, the role of the vector and matrix analysis uh, in it via objects such as the uh, Stokes vector, the Müller matrices and the coherence and covariance matrices. Finally, we will investigate in a comprehensive but succinct way the most uh, widely used electromagnetic models for the two typical scenarios appearing in remote sensing, rough surfaces uh, such as the bare ground or the ocean and volume distribution of scatterers relevant for vegetation canopies or penetrable and stratified soils. The first thing to do is to clarify what we mean by machine code approach. In computer science, uh, machine code means to speak directly the language of the computing machine. In our case, the machine is the reality, governed by Maxwell's equations. These equations describe the dynamics, which is in this case uh, the electrodynamics, of the physical phenomena observed in Earth observation remote sensing. Many high-level languages are nevertheless possible. They do not require coming any close to the Maxwell's equations. Uh, continuing with our metaphor, many high-level languages make it possible to obtain interesting images. However, we often miss the subtleties of the inner complex phenomena, such as high decoherence introduced by scattering processes, multiple scattering, high levels of roughness in terrain and ocean surfaces, or wideband spatial spectrum in the geometry of the targets. Therefore, what we are going to try here is to introduce the necessary tools for a mathematical and physical approach that, uh, that can help us uh, with uh, this uh, metaphoric uh, hardware. The emphasis of this tutorial is going to be in the concepts. We will deal with models having analytical solutions, that is, models that do not have to imply a discretization of the continuous functions to convert them into matrix problems that have to be solved. Ideally, these models have the unknowns at one side of the equal sign of an equation and the parameters at the other. We will not be including the mathematical apparatus of the models uh, we deal with. For a full description, you will have to go to the full references given at the end of the tutorial and work through them. The purpose of this tutorial is to motivate and inspire those who want to get started with the world of electromagnetic modeling, and it is in this context that a general view is provided on methods and alternative models. 
In particular, at the end of the tutorial, we will focus on making a good account of available methods for rough surface scattering and volume distributions of scatterers. Maxwell's equations were written in the original work of the Scottish scientist in terms of quaternions, which is a mathematical language th that is not very uh, common nowadays in the applied sciences. The current vector notation used for them is due to Heaviside. However, I would like to say that the story should start with a microscopic version of Maxwell's equations if we want to start from the very bottom even if only for the sake of completitude. These microscopic Maxwell's equations were derived after Maxwell by the du Dutch physicist Heinrich Lorentz. They were conceived as uh, describing them electromagnetic waves in the vacuum or ether, as it was thought at the time. One of the most frustrating experiences in those coming to study Maxwell's equations is to realize that even if we stick to vector notation, we find a wealth of different versions depending on whether they are written in one system of units or the another, but also on the fact of them including false sources that are put there virtually to represent uh, certain boundary conditions or even depending on the purpose of uh, including some quantum effects, if we are inside solids or condensed matter. The case of the maxwell chern simons version is an extreme case of this, that is brought here only as an illustrative case. A key question about Maxwell's equations is why they are for and if they provide alone a unique solution to any electromagnetic problem. In fact, as a consequence of the Hemholtz theorem, they do, with a couple of nuances. We require the knowledge of the constitutive relations that link E and D on the one hand and B and H on the other, via the electric permittivity and the magnetic permeability. And we also need the knowledge of the boundary conditions defined on the borders of my study area. Another question of interest for the researcher is the one of the candidate mathematical surrogates of the electromagnetic field other than vectors. We do have these other surrogates, even though they have not been used to elaborate the models we are interested in, but still they point at possible future pieces of research. They might provide more insight in these prospective future models. These alternative mathematical objects are tensors, complex vectors of the Riemann-Silverstein type or spinors. We also mention here quaternions even if we should have said uh, Clifford algebras instead. All these objects allow us to build in different levels of symmetry inside the descriptors of the fields. Outside this page, only vectors are considered in this tutorial. From Maxwell's equations, we deduce that electromagnetic fields and waves, that is, time and space oscillating perturbations, that propagate. The wave equation gets simplified when computed on points with no sources. The actions uh, of the sources can always be represented through adequate boundary conditions. Single frequency and elastic analysis takes us to equations that do not contain time derivatives. With the word elastic we mean here that there are no there are no energy transfers between different frequency components of the wave. It is important to bring in the so-called electromagnetic potentials that are often used in replacement or together with the electromagnetic fields, since they greatly simplify the problem. The most well-known potentials 
are the electric scalar potential and the magnetic vector potential, phi and A. But there are also some other interesting pairs of potentials, such as the Hertz vector potentials, which are not used now as much as they were in the past. In fact, they were the standard way of solving electromagnetic engineering problems until the 50s. There is another pair of vectors comprising the standard magnetic vector potential A and the electric vector potential F, which exists only when the density of charge is zero. The introduction of F makes it possible to get a more symmetrical treatment of the electrical and magnetic parts of the field. Another fundamental element of our language here is the intensity of the electric field. It is the intensity what we measure most of the times and it is also the basic descriptor on which theories such as the radiative transfer theory is based. In the concept of coherence we have the first appearance of the idea of time averaging, which is only possible which is the only possible way of detecting a rapidly oscillating electric field. Coherence is also a central concept in active remote sensing. Coherence allows us to obtain information on the time behavior of the field that is lost in the intensity. Coherence is related to the correlation of the field in at least two different points and therefore it does not get cancelled in the product of the fields. It can be measured upon forcing analogical interference of the field coming to or from two different points and can also be digitally computed by processing the signal. These are different descriptors and definitions of coherence that appear on the bottom of this page. The debate has been resumed lately sin since Wolf's 2004 paper that is cited in reference 14. We bring to this page the definition of Tervo, Setala and Freiberg with the classical one and the Wolf's latest definition. There are indeed many subtleties in the concept of coherence. Usually coherence is identified with the so-called memory of the phase of the wave, which gets deteriorated as a consequence of different noisy fluctuations that are affected um, as the wave propagates. This definition of coherence is useful but somehow incomplete. We want to stress that by coherence we mean something that affects more than one point, two at least, and according to Glover, see again his references in, in our reference 14, uh, always, is always even, as it should if we were considering the quantum field based approach of this author. There might also be a classical reason for considering always an even number of points, but this is an open question. We bring here Glover's definition of coherence, which says that a field is coherent if and only if any correlation of the field on an even number of points is equal to the product of the same number of functions, each of which depending only on one point. This analytical separability must not be confused with any algebraic separability of matrices measuring the correlations of the field. In any case, coherence is a very interesting and open field of research. Yet another essential characteristic of the electromagnetic, electromagnetic waves is the, that they are vector waves and therefore they might show specific behaviors in their direction of oscillation showing different degrees of symmetry. Microscopically, molecules tend to radiate and re-radiate as dipoles, and thus linear polarization is expected from them. As the axes of such molecules are usually randomly oriented, 
thermal radiation produces no definite polarization. However, if a polarized wave impinges upon such randomly oriented molecules, they tend to respond in proportion and get aligned themselves by the external field, so they re-radiate accordingly. The first scientist to give a proper mathematical shape to the description of polarization for a wave was Stokes in the mid-19th century. Emil Wolf said once in a provocative way, in a provocative way uh, that almost nothing had been done uh, in the field of polarimetry since Stokes' introduction of his parameters. The basic idea of Stokes was to define four observables that fully characterized polarization. All these four parameters get joined in a so-called vector, which is indeed an object that transforms as a four-component vector, but that shows the weakness of not forming a vector space, since it lacks of inverse vectors, because its first component I is always positive. It is the intensity of the field. It is customary in radar polarimetry to bring up the subject of the Poincaré sphere, even if later it is not used for nothing particularly quantitative. We recommend here to read reference 12 to see how a full use of it is done in optics. It is, however, noteworthy that a 360-degree rotation in the space defined by the last three components of the Stokes vector corresponds to a 180-degree rotation of the electric field in its plane of oscillation. This feature points out at the spinorial nature of the field. David Bebbington from Essex University has done a great deal of effort to convince the radar polarimetry community of the necessity of migrating to this alternative operating system. See reference 13 for completitude. We can now compare the concepts of polarization and coherence. If correlations of the electric field are computed in two different points, we are dealing with coherence, and if we study correlation at a single point, we are observing polarization. Radar polarimetry, again, is concerned with the mutual relationship between the two, as well as with polarization alone. But polarization and coherence can be partial. When we can decompose the field in a fully polarized part, and a completely depolarized part, and the same goes for coherence. The possibility of being partial is a common feature of the two concepts, but the degree of coherence and the degree of polarization, if well defined, should not lead to a one-to-one -one correspondence. Wolf proved that a fully coherent wave might not be polarized at certain points with his definition. Glover's definition, on the contrary, makes polarization a consequence of full coherence because it includes the case in which the two observation points coincide. However, it is useful in this case not to include this, the situation of choosing both points equal. We come back now to the Maxwell equations and ask ourselves how to solve them. There are many possible methods, both for analytical solution, solutions and for numerical solutions. Some are more used in radar and some other more in optics. We will be dealing with three main methods, those based on Green's functions, those related to the solution of the, of the electric field integral equation and its magnetic counterpart, the MFIE those based on the study of intensity. That's the last type. The two fathers of the current formulation of Maxwell's equations are Heaviside and Gibbs. 
the first author wrote them with vector quantities and the second promoted the use of vector analysis at the end of the 19th century and the start of the 20th century. He also introduced the modern ideas of dyads and dyadics. In effect, the most general Green's functions in, electromagneti in electromagnetism are dyadic. But let us introduce basic Green's functions first. So we will make two points. A. Green's functions are impulse response functions as known in many areas of telecommunications theory. And B. Dyads are mappings of a vector space onto another vector space. In the equation for the electric field that we see on this page, the use of a, dyad a di dyadic Green's function makes it possible to see the effect of an element elementary current line on each, let's call it, channel, understood as one of the components of the electric field after decomposing it in a reference frame, depending on the orientation of this elemental current. In this respect, the information carried by a dyadic is of matrix type. If we know the dyadic Green's function and the source current, we can compute the field with the help of the integral that appears at the bottom right of this page. Sometimes we even get an analytical solution. We were speaking about this, this page still. We have spoken quite a bit about electromagnetic propagation, and now it is time to turn our atta attention towards the phenomenon of scattering. Every electromagnetic wave propagates in space and time according to the same law of change with which it was generated, until it finds something new in its propagation path. This happens, for instance, in a transmission line, when impedance changes. It is also the phenomenon occurring in an interface between air and water when light impinges upon it. However, the properties of the propagation medium can change in a more complicated manner, with a higher degree of heterogeneity both from a dielectric and a geometric point of view. This uh, heterogeneity produces, in general, a complex pattern of scattering. There are three sources of electromagnetic radiation. Two sources that we can call primary, one due to actively radiated power, like in a radar, and one due to spontaneous thermal radiation. On the other hand, we have secondary sources that correspond to diffuse reflection or scattering in any of its denominations. The effects of scattering are various, but we highlight the following. First, the change of the main path of the propagation and the redistribution of intensities for different directions. Second, the change or, or loss of polarization. And third, the change in the coherence of the wave. The presence of scattering elements in the propagation path of the wave translates in the values of a change in permittivity and a change in conductivity inside the Maxwell's equations. In general, it is the problem of inserting a function of space inside the parameters permittivity and conductivity. It can also be represented inside a reduced volume of space as the problem of some induced artificial sources as the ones at the bottom left side of this page that are actually a reformulation of the fields on the boundary surrounding the volume of interest. We can distinguish three main cases in the way that permittivity and conductivity change. The first case is that of a finite conductivity that leads us to the scenario of penetrable scatterers. As permittivity is concerned, we will consider the case of constant or non-constant permittivity. We bring the latter to this page 
under the name of penetrable dielectric non-homogeneous scatterer. We can also see here how the EFIE and the MFIE look like for this case. They are integral equations because sources and fields are related through the equations on the bottom left side. The next case is a permittivity in a discontinuous way so that, that its value is constant inside each scatterer. It is the situation of many interesting models explaining the scattering from a dielectric rough surface. We name this case that of a penetrable homogeneous scatterer. Equations look more complex in this case due to the discontinuities on the surface of the scatterers. The subscript M refers to the propagation medium assuming there are only two. In case we have more, we need to include more equations of the same type. The last case of interest is the one of highly conductive scatterers that we usually model as perfectly conducting scatterers, called PEC for perfectly electric conductors. As a method of calculus, we also mention here the extinction theorem, which is used very often in analytical models and in computational electromagnetics. It consists in using boundary conditions that produce the correct field in one of the two subspaces that it defines, but not the other, where the field gets cancelled. That is the reason of its name. And this is why this method is related to scattering from a PEC. It is a frequent approach to treat the electromagnetic scattering problem as if it was a scalar wave problem, which implies no depolarization effects or some sort of symmetry supporting this lack of interchange of energy between cross polarizations. In many occasions, this assumption is not just justified and operates only on a convenience basis. Propagation media in remote sensing is almost always stochastic, or are almost always stochastic, and are characterized by the following common features. First, there are no exact geometrical symmetries. There can be symmetries at the statistical level, though, in what we will soon call ensemble, but not in the individual case under study. Second, the spatial distribution of the scatterers is not known in detail, nor is the geometry of each scatterer. Again, only some statistical knowledge is available. And third, the permittivity as a function of space is not known either, only its statistics. As we have su suggested, there is a set of scattering scenarios that we call ensemble, which is defined by the fact of having the same statistics without being identical. Each scenario is called realization of the ensemble. This statistical approach is not only a mathematical convenience, because in remote sensing most of the scenes are the result of composing many data takes. Ergodicity is usually defined as the equivalence of the time and space statistical moments over their, their respective ensembles. Nonetheless, we will make a more general definition here, as relevant as the other in the field of remote sensing. It is the property for which two different collections of data are statistically equivalent, one corresponding to a single realization being observed and then under varying circumstances, different observation angles or different times, and the other corresponding to the same circumstances 
but over a number of different realizations. One example, the received power of a radar echo from a stochastic target. When it comes to model it, is the average of the square of the field amplitude, computed over an ensemble to which the target belongs, as a concrete realization of it. When we speak about electromagnetic scattering, often the dichotomy of single versus multiple scattering is mentioned. Even expressions such as single bounce and double bounce are used. However, waves are not rays, and this language might be misleading. For instance, the result of scattering in media containing many scatterers and interacting among them can be sometimes explained in terms of mean field theories, which transform a multiple scattering problem into a single scattering problem, and they do so only as a consequence of a change in the mathematical treatment. A way of improving the insight on what is going on in the scattering phenomenon is to tackle the problem in the space Fourier transform domain. This makes it possible to picture every plane wave component as identified with a wave vector. This language allows us to describe interactions which, with, with targets in a clearer way in this regard. Another very useful tool in the study of scattering is the use of Stokes vectors. In this framework, scattering is described by the transformation of a Stokes vector into another. This mapping is represented by the action of a 4x4 matrix that is usually called Muller matrix. Radial practitioners often name it Keno uh, matrix, though. The Muller matrix is related to the Jones matrix J through a simple equation that appears on this page. The Jones matrix relating the incident and scatter field uh, has also another name in the radar, radar field, Singler matrix. This matrix formalism speaks in terms of observables and not fields and can be computed on the basis of ergodicity over an ensemble of realizations. In the field of radar polarimetry, there are another couple of matrices of great interest, in principle equivalent to the Muller matrix, the coherency and the covariance matrices. They are quite useful because they show more symmetry than Muller's and allows us to apply a number of decomposition schemes including those based on eigenvector and eigenvalue analysis. Still, these approaches contain a great deal of heuristics, or when they are based on physical models, these are very simple ones. Their main pro is that they provide a simple and useful way of analyzing data and producing revealing pictures. Before starting to discuss scattering, we had brought along the issues of polarization and coherence as features of the electric field. Now, it is very interesting to analyze the loss of coherence that occurs in a wave as a consequence of scattering, and how this is related to the change or loss of polarization. The loss of both is linked to the, the, the correlation of the field with itself and linked as well to the building of another correlation, that of the field with the scatterer. The, later hap the latter sorry, happens in an irreversible way, in the sense that the entropy of the signal increases. There are different definitions of entropy that we could use, the one of von Neumann, the one of Shannon, uh, the one of Kolbach, but we cannot get too deep into that now. In any case, we are talking about the entropy of the signal, not the entropy of the target here. Before we revise the electromagnetic models available for rough surfaces 
and volume distributions of scatterers, we want to make a couple of extra comments on coherence. We do so because the adjectives coherent and incoherent apply to the scattering phenomenon as well as to the fields. There are two perspectives that we can take to deal with the phenomenon of decoherence in scattering, the point of view of the wave and the point of view of the scattering secondary source. From the, from the ver first viewpoint and applying global definition to the intensity of the field, we see that the field can be decomposed in two components, one coherent and one incoherent. If the wave is coherent before interaction with the scatterer, then the information about the scatterer due to this correlation that we have just said it forms between the wave and the scatterer gets into the incoherent component, thereby the interest of scattering models in the incoherent component. From the viewpoint of the sources, two of them are incoherent if their faces are decorrelated. The scatterers are secondary sources and therefore this is applicable to scatterers. If decoherence occurs as a consequence of scattering, the complex field gets decorrelated among different secondary sources. Thus, this decoherence translates into the different scattering contributions getting directly summed in terms of the Stokes vectors and the Mueller matrices. We come now to the point of discussing the most a specific application of the study of scattering phenomena to remote sensing that gets included in this tutorial, namely the modeling of the two possible scenarios that we can have. First, the scattering from rough surfaces, which is the most representative model for terrain bare surfaces or even scarcely vegetated soils. Secondly, we will see the models applied to volume distributions of scatterers, which is the relevant situation for vegetation canopies, snow or soil profiles where electromagnetic waves can penetrate. Most of the models study and predict the received power, which is the information placed in this view graph in the inner circle of the diagram that appears on the uh, right side. The outer circles correspond to complementary information that is not so often treated in these models, or at least it is only treated in a marginal manner. Note that these concepts such as Stokes parameters, polarization or coherence are not somehow hidden in the model. This is an interesting topic for those interested in embarking themselves in modeling. To include specific tools and uh, mechanisms to treat with these three external circles in our diagram. There is a vast number of models available to explain rough surface scattering. It is indeed fundament a fundamental topic for modeling, simulation and data analysis. An attempt to look for this topic in the IEEE search literature machine with the keywords rough surface scattering produces thousands of results including both journal articles and conferences. Here we just want to give a general overview in the shape of a tree of a possible classification of some of the most important and used models for rough surface scattering. For a more detailed analysis, we recommend the very complete and ambitious review given in reference 27. This view graph includes the six foremost approaches to solve analytically the problem. Two of them are the most commonly reported as principal models, the method of small perturbations or SPM and the Kirchhoff approximation. In fact, one of the main objectives of most of the other models has long been 
to encompass in a single model these two. We will discuss the main conceptual points of the models depicted here. We do not have the time and space to go into the mathematica mathematical details in this tutorial, but a full list of references to start with is provided. Those interested in the subject should go straight to them. The SPM model is, as we have just said, one of the most popular methods. It is also known as Bragg model. Its original derivation is based on the so-called Rayleigh hypothesis, which assumes that only out outgoing waves are to be considered when writing the electromagnetic interaction between points of the surface. Although this hypothesis was not justified in a rigorous manner originally, the SPM and this assumption were proven right later on by solving the problem with the help of the extinction theorem that we mentioned before. Hence, SPM is an exact model at first order in a perturbation series based on the standard deviation of the height of the surface as expansion parameter. The mathematical result is very simple and its use is widespread. If SPM is a model based on taking the standard deviation of the height as the small parameter of the model that allows it to remain at first order, the Kirchhoff approximation is based on taking the curvature of the surface with the same role of a small parameter so that the Fresnel coefficients explain the reflection of the field at each point. On top of that, a modulation occurs in the field due to the different heights. Specifically, the Kirchhoff approximation contains two different models, that of the geometrical optics and the one of the physical optics, for large and small height standard deviations, respectively. The formalism developed by Dyson and Bede, together with Salpeter for quantum field theory, is also applicable to the problem of rough surface scattering, and so has it been applied. Such a formalism is prone to techniques like diagram diagrammatic analysis or renormalization. Again, a small parameter is needed to carry on the perturbative, perturbative analysis that it is based upon. There is a very interesting technique due to Nakayama and Ogura that relies on considering the fields as stochastic variables from the very beginning. This implies to write the problem as one of stochastic differential equations instead of ordinary ones. This approach has not been exploited much in the field of remote sensing modeling, but gives the possibility of computing directly the probability distributions of the observables without having to compute the solution for a deterministic particular scenario and average the result over an ensemble. Despite its interesting features, the theory of it has focused more on boundary conditions that are not the most relevant ones for remote sensing, like Dirichlet's or Neumann's. Another strategy consists in analytically fitting a kernel in the integral expression of the electric field to meet both SPM and Kirchhoff as limit cases for their respective ranges of applicability. In this family of models we find the small slope approximation or SSA, which assumes that the small parameter is the first derivative of the height, instead of the height itself, like in SPM, or instead the second derivative like in the Kirchhoff approximation. SSA has been used in many studies related to remote sensing of the Earth. There are two other models of this type, namely the local weight approximation, LWA, due to Dachshund and uh, Wormser, and the weighted curvature approximation, 
WCA due to L4 Haley. The latter has been employed in a number of ocean-related scattering problems. These models are not derived from first principles because they come about as functional guesses. A rather old method that has gone through many revisions during the last 30 years is the full wave method of Bahar. It involves a complex formulation that requires some heavy computation for producing numerical results. Besides, it presents some consistency problems as noted by El Fogeli and Guerin in their 2004 study. As we cite here according to our reference 27 that you can consult. Another model that is considered a classic model is the two scale model that also intends to join SPM and the Kirchhoff approximation, although it does so by imposing up uh, a priori two scales of given magnitude, but leaving an arbitrary gap in between. This model does not have much backing from the theoreticians. Finally, we will deal with the integral equation model, or IEM. It is possible, possibly the most widely used model in the remote sensing literature. It is based on performing a second iteration in the integral equations of the EFIE with the Kirchhoff field. It was developed by Adrian Fung and has been subject to many revisions and corrections during the last 30 years by him uh, and by other researchers. In one of its most advanced versions, the IEM2MC, it bridges the gap between SPM and Kirchhoff for all type of surfaces, either of real or complex permittivities. In principle, this model can be iterated to higher order to produce a Born series, even though convergence might be an issue for some parameter values. Also, further iteration lead to integrals for which no clean analytical solution exists. As we have said, many versions of IEM have been developed throughout these last three decades. We sketch a timeline here showing the main versions, the years in which they were introduced and the key references to them. We also include a table in which we compare, we compare their performance against some theoretical consi consistency tests. Originally, IEM relied on a faulty assumption about the phase of the expansion of the Green's function in terms of plane waves. This assumption was removed completely with IEM 2M. We also signal here the compliance of the different IEM versions with the Lorentz reciprocity theorem. Finally, we want to offer a similar general view for the study of scenarios made out of volume distributions of scatterers, as we just did for rough surface scattering. Here we have two main families of models, those of the radiative uh, transfer theory based on the energy balance of the field intensity and those derived directly from Maxwell's equations. In both cases, we make the distinction between dense and non-dense media. As Maxwell-related models are concerned, we also make a difference depending on the scatterers being discrete or continuous. Radiative transfer theory is not based on Maxwell, but on the equation that appears on this page which tells that the change in the intensity of the fields 
along a certain direction is due to four components. The part of the intensity that gets lost out of such direction by scattering, proportional to key E, the part that gets absorbed by the dielectric, dielectric proportional, the dielectric proportional to KAG. Third, the contribution due to some potential source J, internal to the to the points included in this direction, and the contribution to the intensity from other directions that get scattered towards this specific direction. This last contribution originates from any possible other directions and therefore must be represented by an integral whose kernel we call phase matrix, noted as P here. Even though the radiative transfer theorem theory is sometimes said not to include coherent components, in fact, these coherent effects do appear through the use of the phase matrix, which is usually computed with the help of Maxwell's theory. Furthermore, radiative transfer theory, originally introduced with the equation of, of the last page, can be proven to be a consequence of the Bethe-Salpeter equation under the so-called ladder approximation. How can we solve the radiative transfer equation then? Perturbative techniques are often used either at first order or at higher orders, but other techniques are available, such as the eigenanalysis applied to a discretized version of it. A precise way of solving this, this equation is the matrix doubling theorem. The extension of the radiative transfer can also be rigorously derived from an extension of a method that we mention in the next page, the quasi-crystalline approximation. So it, it is a, a rigorous theory as well in the case of dense um, scenarios. Methods based on Maxwell's equations are more complete in the sense that they take full account of all the internal correlations of the field. Again, we find ourselves in a research field where models abound. We will mention those that, we have, that, that have become more well known. We can distinguish two types of techniques. On the one hand, we have those that apply to continuous media of variable permittivity, where we have models based on the formalism developed by Bethe Salpeter that we already mentioned for the case of rough surface scattering, diagrammatic techniques, um, and those based on renormalization, both of them actually applicable to the Bethe Salpeter equation. And also, in addition to them, we have other methods that do not rely on having a small parameters to expand on, and to those we, we refer with the term strong fluctuation theories. On the other hand, we have discontinuous media containing many discrete scatterers in stochastic arrangements, which are usually solved, solved with the help of the T-matrix method, the effective field approximation or the quasi-crystalline approximation. These last two models can be framed inside the so-called hierarchical models that can be found in statistical mechanics. Obviously, this is not the place to give a full detail of these models and we have to make do with mentioning them and trying to inspire those who might be interested in investigating and using them to improve the analysis of remote remote sensing data. The last message we want to convey is that natural scenarios are hybrid and bring together bare rough surfaces, rough surfaces with vegetation on top of them, forests, 
impenetrable soils and so on. So things might even get more complicated than we have seen so far. We stress the fact that proper modeling is always necessary. Einstein once said that everything, and therefore, therefore also models, should be as simple as possible, but not simpler. Thank you very much.